Welcome to Stories from the Center of the Universe, the podcast about the human experience. Ahmad Hawkins, welcome to the Center of the Universe. Great to have you. Glad to be on. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, hey, we connected to you through Dwight Vick, and I said, I said, hey, Dwight, what are the chances you can get me Mike Vick? He said, I might be able to get you two minutes, man. I said, all right, well, who's the one guy, if you could, could get on my podcast, who's the one person you know would be awesome for it? And he immediately said you. <laughs> what, what, why, why is that? Because he know I'm going to talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, who talks more, you or Dwight? Oh, man. If it's something with a lot of substance, he does. If it's joking around and <laughs> going nowhere, is me. <laughs> That's fair. Right. Well, we like enjoy it. both, so it's, so it's all good. All right, so you and I had talked before uh, tonight, and you're from Hampton. Were you born in that area? Yeah, I was born in I mean, Newport News, and then I moved to Hampton. But, you know, if you've been down there, it's five minutes away from each other. You never know if you're in Hampton or if you're in Newport News now. Right. So we, when you were a kid, it, and Dwight said that he played a bunch of sports growing up, and he also played wall ball. Did you ever play wall ball? What is that? Kevin, do you remember what his description <laughs> was? <laughs> it, it's something to do with throwing a ball. You're, you're, you're next to somebody, you throw a ball against the wall, and you've got to catch it before it either bounces once or not. Oh, no. it, it was something. We played something similar, a number, but. A number gets called, and, and then you just start throwing the ball at whoever the number is. Oh, yeah. yeah. We just throw the ball at you. <laughs> you, and you don't mess around with any bouncing ball. Dodge ball. <laughs> <laughs> so when you when you were a kid, uh, there you go. Was it just sports all the time? All the time. That's all I did. I was playing football, basketball, or baseball. Um, my my parents kept me in sport. Well, I was drawn to it because my dad played football and baseball, and I had so much energy. I would just play pickup basketball. So I didn't play organized basketball growing up until I got into middle school, but. Football and baseball, I started at five years old. Both oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. Like like rec ball kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. So T-ball, I was legal to start at five. Football, I was supposed to be six. but Were you dad, playing tackle? Yeah. Tackle at six? At five. <laughs> well, yeah, sorry, at five, yeah. uh, pretending to be a six-year-old. Yeah. That's, I was uh, linebacker. <laughs> that's crazy. Were you a bigger kid when you were that young? No, I was pretty on par with a lot. Of, well, I think I was bigger than the five year olds because I was playing with six and seven year olds, so I was their size. So, right. Um, yeah, all my growing went early because as you, I'm not a big guy right now. So, well, that's what I was asking. Were you, you were a big dude up until like seventh or eighth grade, and then people started passing. Yeah, I was, kind of thing? I was considered big until like fourth grade. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait a minute. What what are your uh, what's your height and weight when I'm you were a senior at UVA? Um, I, I'm five nine and a quarter, according to the scouts and professionals. But I always thought it was five ten, five so, ten and a half. So, so we're gonna say five ten. Yeah, or we're five ten and a half. We'll even give you that. No, 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 no. I ain't gonna do the half. We just do five ten. That's fine. Because people, if you say five <laughs> ten and a half, they're gonna say we lying. They they accept five ten. <laughs> we're gonna go with five ten. There we go. Official answer. And, and then your your weight. You weren't a, a big, huge dude, no, right? Uh -uh. I mean, the most I ever weighed. I mean, when I got started playing arena football, my last couple of years, I was over 200. Majority of the time, I was between like 185 and 190. I, I, last time I weighed 185, I was a sophomore in high school. <laughs> <laughs> you were in fourth grade. Stop I remember, I might have been, it might have been in elementary school. Yeah, it's all good. All right, so football, what were you playing? You're playing outside linebacker, you said, when you were really little. But when you started uh, growing up in football, what did you start to gravitate to? Running back. My dad was a running back, so I just played running back. I played running back all rec league, JV football. Like, I was a running back. That's just what I did. I loved Marcus Allen growing up and Bo Jackson, of course, because he was playing football and baseball. So those were the two running backs that I admired the most. I loved the Raiders growing up. My dad was a Raider fan, so um, I was a running back. And he knew that position night and day, so – he was a great resource for me. And, um, yeah, man, I just – I didn't like to get hit a lot, so I just outran everybody. Well, if you're playing foot, football and, and you're fast enough to avoid being hit, that's great. But eventually they're going to be guys as fast as you, right? 
No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> as scared as I was, man, no, I wasn't allowing it. I mean, I, as much as I love playing football, I hated getting hit. Hated it. Hated Did you ever it. like it? I started liking it once I got to high school. Right. Because guys started being just as fast, so you had to – well, how our practices were designed, you had to end up liking getting hit or you wasn't going to last. Like Coach Smith. It was a very, it was very physical practice. So my freshman year in high school, like my eyes were just like, what the hell is this? Like, this is too much. Like, let me, I'm running to the outside. I'm not going in there. I'm bouncing it. That's what I did in JV. Hey, 42 trap. Okay, cool. Get the ball. I'm bouncing. (laughs) I'll I'll start in that direction, but I'm not, I'm not going in there. If I go through the hole, I'm going super fast just to bounce it. (laughs) <laughs> All right, so let's hold on. Let's go back to the, you being a Raiders fan. Your dad uh-huh. was a Raiders fan, so that just made you a Raiders fan. Yeah. yeah. All right, right on. And, and Marcus Allen, one of the greatest Super Bowl plays of all time, mm-hmm. is when he was going outside and then he bounced it the entire opposite direction. He went over fifty, right? Yeah, I think. Yeah, that was over seventy yeah, versus, versus yeah versus run. Redskins. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah I can't stand the ball the like a loaf of bread too. It was nice. I used to he, get in he, trouble for that. Yeah, he was. He was. Uh, <laughs> He was a very good running back, but uh, Bo Jackson, and I have to mention this, was drafted by my favorite team, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And he said he was so disappointed in being drafted by the Bucs, he said he would never play football again, and he was only <laughs> going to play baseball. And then, what, two years later, he's playing for the Raiders. Man, he sounded like John Elway. <laughs> That's exactly yeah. what he did. Or Eli Manning. Yeah. Oh, and then Eli did it, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, to my team, the Chargers. That's great. Yeah. Super Chargers. All right, so mm-hmm. if you're playing running back, well, in high school, you, you got used to the hitting at some point. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you play running back throughout high school? No, I moved a receiver um, my freshman year because we had a, a top running back named Walter Ford, but I was backing him up. But I could get on the field right away as the season progressed if I moved out to receiver. So I did that. How, how many years did you play varsity? Um, four years, all four years. Oh, man, so you weren't a big dude and you're playing as a freshman on varsity. Mm-hmm. For Hampton, who I know had a ton of talent back then. I mean, they've yeah. always had a ton of talent. Yeah, right? it was – it was practices were rough. Like, getting on the field as a freshman was definitely rough because everything was so easy to me. So I got to Hampton, and that freshman camp was very tough because it was so many talented players. And um, Dwight Vick was on that team. He was a senior. And um, just the adjustment. Like I said, getting hit repeatedly because I was on, like, scout team a lot. So I, that's the, that's when I had to get used to getting hit because I had to run the play that the team ran. So, um, who 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 were your quarterbacks in in high school when you're fresh, freshman all the way to senior? Freshman year was John Logan. He, he was number ten. He was a pitcher on our baseball team. I played baseball my freshman year, freshman sophomore year on varsity too. He was a hell of a pitcher, and he was a good quarterback. So it's hard to say he was a good quarterback because then you had Ronald Curry come right after him. <laughs> but John was good, but Ron was just so spectacular that he made John look average. You yeah. know, but, but John was good in his own right, but he was a hell of a baseball player. John Logan. Yeah, well, uh, Ronald Curry, uh, well, and, and you ended up being a UVA guy. He 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 broke your heart and my heart, right, not coming to UVA. Yeah, well, I, I know the true story. And, you know, one day he'll have like a, a special and he can tell why. But, um. I wasn't heartbroken when he told me why he was going to UNC. I was disappointed, but I understood, you know. Dean Smith. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he he didn't play very long for Dean Smith, right? Hey, hey, I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah, I guess Dean Smith's more of a draw than whoever the UVA basketball coach was back then. Pete Gillen. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'd pick Dean Smith over Pete Gillen, I think. Even though Pete was was a solid coach. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he did good. He had Donald Hamlin. Pete Gillen, yeah. And Chris Williams, like we had a nice basketball team. It, Mark, would've, see, he would have helped. So when you said uh, rough practices, so scrimmages, they they can be pretty physical or very physical. What kind of drills were y'all running? Were y'all doing bull in the ring, Oklahoma drills, that kind of stuff? Yeah, that's when it was allowed. So we were bull in the ring as soon as we – somebody might bull in the ring just for being late to practice. So you were running a lap around the field, and then everybody started forming a circle. And I'm like, oh, man, we going to clap it up. No. Somebody's getting punished. Somebody left they, their their socks out or somebody didn't put their cleats in the lock or somebody had their pads up wrong. Like, that was like boot camp. Like, people were getting their hind pots kicked. I, I, it didn't matter who it was. I was so nervous every time I come to practice. 
because I was like, okay, did I put my pants up right? Did I have my equipment <laughs> up right? Is my helmet sitting right? Because I didn't want to get my tail beat, man. Like, dude, it was not really bull in the ring. They were just like, it was almost like who's was getting beat into a gang. Like, they were stomping on you and kicking you and stuff. Like, it was brutal. What? Yeah. Bully it's, it's, in the ring. That's the lemonade uh, uh, statues, uh, whatever it is. The, sta- the statue that. limitations are way up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was bully in the ring. I like that. It was bullies yeah, in the bully ring. in the ring. <laughs> yeah, it was pl- plural. Yeah. Oh, oh. Huh. It won't, no, because sometimes you'd be like, 10, Poof, and they go, 14. Poof. It was, hey, man, you left your clothes out. You know better than that. Come on, man. And then a circle get around, and they're trying to explain, and they're clapping so loud you can't hear them. Like, come on, man, you know I mean it. Pop, 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 pop. Get up. No, I want to get up. Just stay down. Pop. Pop. And I'm sitting there like, this is how they so good? <laughs> they, they, well, I mean, going through all that, they had to be the toughest team on the field every Oh, uh, buddy, every yes. Yes, sir. Now, one thing about Crab of Pride, won't nobody going to out-tough you. That's for sure. Nobody yeah. going to out-tough you or out-work you because we was going to work, work, work. I mean, back then you didn't have a time limit on practice. I'll give you a prime example. Two a days, we come in at you got to be on the field by 6 a.m., regardless if the sun is up, whatever. Practice will end maybe 10.30. You get home, be like 11, 11.30, depending on your ride. You got to be back on the field at 3.30. And then that practice will end around 8. That's a lot. Of, that's a lot. And that was for four weeks. Y'all did that for a month. Yeah. And we had scrimmages on Saturday, so you probably only got Sundays off. You just got Sunday off. That you try uh, to recover. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. I it's mean, I, so I played high school football. I think we had three weeks, and we did maybe four hours total per day. Oh no, we we did that during during the season. Like we would get out at three o'clock. You better be on the field by three thirty, so you can't be lollygagging with your little girlfriends and stuff. You better hit it to the. To the uh to locker room, but get taped up. Matter of fact, get taped up before you go to last period, or get taped up before you go to fifth period. Go get taped because if you late, you're gonna be in that bully ring. <laughs> yeah. But are, are we officially uh, cl- classifying bully ring as the the real thing that happened? Yeah, one no bulls. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but so how many state championships did y'all win when you played there? I won two. Ronald won three, and then. His cousin Armando and then Jared Green, they won that class won four. And and what uh level, what division is uh Hampton? We division five back then. Yeah. And and I my senior year, we was classified as national champs. And then Ronald's senior year, they repeated as national champs. So two of his state rings are considered national championships also. Because he's ranked number one in the in the country by USA Today and other publications. Yeah. Right. It was like co- college back then. They had the AP number one, the coaches poll number yeah. one kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And and Dwight was reminding me that Ronald was not only the uh, national player of the year in football, he was the national player of the year in basketball. Absolutely. That's never happened before. He was a phenom. Four cents. Yeah, he's a phenom. He was a, so we went to the playoffs my ninth grade year. And – um. He won't, he can't. So, you could bring JV guys to the playoff game just to make yourself look like you got a lot of people. And he was one <laughs> of the JV guys. Well, JV usually ninth and 10th graders and some eighth graders. I played JV in eighth grade. So, he was on JV in eighth grade. So, he came up to practice because we knew he'll be our quarterback next year, get him some experience. So, all week he on scout team and he lighting it up. So, mm. we get, we playing IC Norcom at their place, and they end up winning the state championship. They got a hell of a defense, and we're warming up. So John Logan is the starter, and we're going through our pat and go and our routes on air, and Ronald's behind him. So they're both throwing. So I catch a pass, and I remember going over the 50, which was a no-no, and I see Norcom, a couple of the defenders was like, you better get your ASS back over there. And I didn't say nothing. They were like, hey, yo, by the way, where y'all get that quarterback at? He won't on the film. Y'all cheating. I was like, who, number 12? It was like, yeah. I was like, oh, he's just an eighth grader. It was just like, what? I said, yeah, he played JV. It was just like, oh, no, nah, I don't believe that. They didn't believe me. And then all game, as the game was going on, and I was 
uh, guy was the DB was checking me. He was like, bro, is 12 really not going to get in the game? I was like, bro, he's an eighth grader. He's not going to get in the game. <laughs> and they were so glad. It, yeah, was he, better win what, it now. <laughs> yeah, did he, did he look like he was his he was big enough to be a senior in high school, or was it that he just looked so smooth throwing the ball? Oh man, his arm is just crazy. So I played against him when I was in Reckley. When I, I moved to Hampton in sixth grade, seventh grade. So the first year I played for Aberdeen, which is where Allen Iverson played Reckley that, and Marcus Higgins. I met Ron when I was in seventh grade. He was in sixth grade. We were scrimmaging a team called Hampton Tornadoes, and I knew nothing about these other rec lead establishments and organizations. So they said, we're going to play against Hampton Tornadoes. Hulk, like they got this quarterback that's good named Ronald Curry. And I was like, okay. Like, I don't care. Like, I, I wasn't from Hampton, so I didn't know. And uh, so we get there at a middle school. My middle school was just Lindsay Middle School. We scrimmaged them there. At Aberdeen, we used to scrimmage at Aberdeen Park. So we go to Lindsay and we get there late. So we don't see them warming up. So I don't know who he is. And he, he's not playing defense. So we get the ball first, and they throw a swing pass to me. I take it 80. And I'm like, this is going to be easy. So I go to the sideline. I move my take a knee, and I just hear, oh, S word. And I go, <laughs> what? And they say, look up. And I looked up, and the ball is like, Poof, like a missile. And I was like, damn, who kicked that? It was like, nobody kicked that. That dude just threw it. I said, what dude? I said, Ronald Curry, ain't you paying attention? I said, no, nah, I was getting some water. So we we back on the field. So I still haven't technically seen him yet. I just saw the ball. So I get <laughs> we get on, we get on offense again. I end up scoring again. So this time I make a point to stand on the sideline. So he runs out. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. That's somebody uncle? Because he's like 6'1. <laughs> wait a minute, how old are we all again? He's in the sixth grade. <laughs> <laughs> like six feet, six one. I'm like, uncle. I'm like, yo, who uncle is that right there? He was like, yo, that's Ronald Kerr. I said, oh, hell no. And then uh -huh. he said, he was like, ready, damn. And then his goal was where we like, go, go. And then he got the ball, rolled out, and launched it about 60 yards. Like, poof. I was just like, wait a minute. Our quarterback just throw swing passes. I mean, we throw like quick out slants. We run an uh, run, old school run and shoot with popcorn, with little pop passes where you had two wings. You go into motion, the orbit motion, you go around and they throw it to you like that. Well, he was throwing it, throwing it. And I was just like, yo, this Joker is nice. So I go to meet him and he got the like the lightest voice. Like, hey, man, how you doing? I'm just like, you are the guy they talking about? And then he, you know, he I never, I yet, never, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I'm just like, cause he was so tall. Like, you know, I'm a short guy. So I'm just looking at him like, you can be like, how you doing, brother? And I was like, hey man, how you doing? <laughs> but he was phenomenal. I played against him in basketball too. He played, against, he played for a Pine Chapel Blue Devils. I played for the Aberdeen Lakers and they kicked our tail twice. And he played center. He was LeBron. He played center, but he was playing point guard too. He wore number 23. He was the tallest kid on the court. He was like grazing the rim. He won't dunk it yet, but he was grazing the rim. And uh, then we played against, played uh, as teammates on the AAU team, and we won like a tournament in DC. And that's how we ended up becoming friends. Because during that that summer, we got to like really talk and stuff like that. But he was an urban legend when he was in sixth grade. I mean, if I heard some sixth grader was throwing sixty yards, I'd be like, I, I don't believe that. Wow, that ridiculous. can't be true. So you fast forward to when I his freshman year, my sophomore year, I'm like this, it because coach like Hawkins, you want to go to uh, you want to go out to running back? I'm like, no, nah, I'm playing receiver because he could chuck it. Like I'm going deep, I'm just running nine routes, just throw it. <laughs> and we in camp and he letting it fly. And I'm talking about, it don't matter how fast I run, he hit me in try every time. He would, I remember he would hit his, you know, fifth or seventh step, and his favorite thing was to hit his last step. He would flip the ball. And he catch the lace real quick and just choo. that's how he would time me up when I was running by somebody to make sure he didn't like under throw me over throw me. And that was just his, it was the sweetest thing ever, man. He hit his last step and he would spin the ball real quick, catch the lace and flick it. And it was the easiest ball to catch, man. Like, like one of the most accurate quarterbacks. He's probably the most accurate guy I've ever been around. Mm. To make every throw and it was easy going to his left going to his right feet set 
feet not set. Like he made it. Man, football was so easy with him on a on a uh, field, man. So easy. <laughs> well, I, so I, I remember when uh, Ronald was a, a junior, and and everybody knew who he was by the time he was a senior. I mean, across the state, yeah. And uh, nobody really knew who Michael Vick was back then. It, it was yeah. always about Ronald. Yep. And I grew up with Mike at in Nupa News. We played baseball together, and Mike always had this rocket arm. So I knew of Mike before I went to Hampton. So I knew Mike could throw. So it never dawned on me that those two would be going up against each other because, you know, when I got to Hampton, I didn't know if Mike would continue to play quarterback. I thought he would play running back because he was so fast. So when we ended up playing when I was at Hampton and he was at Ferguson my junior year and he was starting, I was just like, oh, I call him Oop. I was like, oh, yeah, Oop done got nice, you know, because we was gearing up for them. And it was like, Ahmad, you're from Newport News. Do you know Michael Vick? I was like, oh, yeah, I know him good. It was like, how is his arm? Is his arm like Ronald? I was like, um, he throw harder than Ron. <laughs> That's all I said. It was like, but is his arm strong like Ron's? I was like, he throw harder. Like, it's the same. He's not as accurate as Ron, but he could throw it on a rope. And we, had, we hadn't seen a quarterback like that since we played against Aaron Brooks my freshman year. So it was hard going up against him, too. I mean, the, the amount of talent that, that has come out of that area is, is insane. And, and I want to talk about this a little bit later, uh, about recruiting from Virginia Tech and UVA mm -hmm. from the Tidewater area. It, it's been up and down uh, for both schools for the last, I don't know, 30 years. Yeah. So we'll talk about that in a second. So not once have I ever uttered, yeah, I got a swing pass and I took it 80. That's I, I've never been able to say that. <laughs> now, when you say you took it 80 – did you juke a couple dudes and then you're just gone because you're faster than I was? Just, I, I was Eric Dickinson back then. I'm just running straight. I but, wasn't the guy known to juke a lot of people <laughs> coming up through rec league. I would just run by you fast, like stiff arm you and go. All right, like my dad was like, go. Don't spend a lot of time dancing and stuff. Just put your foot in the ground and go. I didn't know how to start yeah. dancing until I got became a freshman in high school when I realized – yeah, you might run fast straight ahead, but they would decleat you too. So you better start breaking down and cutting back, you know. So, um, but th at that young age, I just ran straight as fast as I could. I, it's it's a time that when I was playing directly at Doris Miller in Newman News, um, I I I got a a a pitch to the left, and I couldn't get outside, and I turned around, and it was a two linemen waiting for me, and I ran the wrong way just to outrun them and get space. And then I turned it all the way back around and went to the right end zone and scored. You went the opposite direction. I went the opposite direction and ran as fast as I can fast to the I other end zone. Other end. And people are saying, you're going the wrong way. But I knew I was going the wrong way. I just wanted to create space so I could turn around and then just outrun them. Because everybody followed me. As I was looking back, everybody was coming to the side I was at. So I just went to the left. And once I got to the to my left, which was end up being the right side of the field going the right way. Once I hit the sideline, and I went all the way to the sideline. And back then my mom would chase, my mom would run with me. So I could just hear her like, go, baby, go, 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 go. And I just heard her saying, go, go. And I'm just <laughs> just breathing. I never would look and see if somebody was coming. I would just run at my head <laughs> like this. And I just got to the end zone. It was like, boy, you ran. About 150 yards just to score that touchdown. <laughs> like, That's one of the best things ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Was your mom keeping up with you? Uh, my mom was fast. She ran track. Oh, wow. My mom was fast. <laughs> All right. I, I got to ask, since you we're talking about taking to the house, running 80 yards or 150 yards, wh wh what was your 40 time at its best? Uh, at my best, the fast I've ever been clocked is 4-3-2. Wow. Oh, that, that – I, I they timed me back in the day with a sundial. That's how, that's how fast I am. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. Did you ever run the hundred? Yeah, I ran the hundred. Um, I got clocked at ten five electronic when we ran had an invitational my junior year at Hampton High School. Um, and it was two guys from Perf and Boy, New Jersey, that beat me though. Um, but I that was I, I ran a ten five. That was my fastest time electronic. Was your dad fast too, or just your mom? Yeah, my dad was fast. 
My yeah. dad was fast. My dad played at Huntington High School in Newport News, which was like Hampton High School back in the what's that the sixties? Yeah. I don't want to date my dad too much, but back in the sixties, Huntington High School, the Vikings were just like the Hampton Crabbers. Like wow. he sent me articles now and people be like, Oh yeah, your dad's team was a dynasty like the t- team you played on. And he had a quarterback that was similar to Toronto. His quarterback actually was ambidextrous. He could throw with both hands. So mm-hmm. um just hearing this, his stories from his friends when I was at Hampton High were priceless because they would just they would brag about us and then they would say, I wonder if your team could beat your dad's team. And I was like, what are you talking about? And they started showing me old clippings. And that's oh, when they had the long sleeve jerseys. Yeah. You know, wow. like the cloth ones. I'm like, how did y'all play in those, dad? And he wore like, he was like an offensive guard for a little while. And then his coach came to him when he was working at a um ice shop. He was bagging ice. And he was like, Hawkins, I'm gonna put you at running back. And my dad ended up wearing uh he ended up wearing 40 because he loved Gail Sayers. So and my, wow. my pops could roll. He was a he he was just a good a baseball player. Then he went to Hampton Institute and played for Coach Baco. Oh wow. Yeah. That's cool. All right. So uh you played wide receiver your entire four years at Hampton? Yeah. I mean I played some running back. Um I my junior year, I played. I started two games at running back. Chris Risk got hurt, and I ran for two forty and two twenty five back to back games. <laughs> and I thought I wasn't going to play receiver anymore, so I got scared. So I thought I messed. Like even Ronald was like, "Man, we need to keep you at running back." I'm like, "Man, shut up, man! I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to catch more deep routes." I, I, I need, I, I, I need, I, I need space. So, yeah, I was so sore after those two games, bro. I have never been sore in high school like I was those back to back weeks playing running back. I bet. Oh, that's different pain, man. Well, you're getting you're getting pounded by shoulder pads and helmets, and you're running yeah. long distances. Yeah, and you know the worst part is when you score as a running back, and everyone will come smacking your face. And stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, so that, that's a great point. So everybody, uh, whenever football comes up, a lot of people talk about CTE and concussions and those things, and. The, the really, really bad concussions tend to happen, high impact, wide receiver mm-hmm. with a DB, that kind of thing. But the interior linemen are getting smacked in the head all the time. All the time. And, and I know that smacking a teammate on the helmet after they score a touchdown is sort of this traditional everybody's hyped up. But you're actually – it's not good for the, for the guy's brain long term, right? Smack, give me a hand <laughs> smack. Smack my hand, smack my pad. I used to hate getting – and Darnell Holly, shout out to Darnell Holly. He used to smack us. And I'll face so hard when we scored or something. And he'd be waiting on the sideline. We'd be like, oh, hell no. Hey, man, get in front of Darnell. He not slap. I would take my helmet off real quick. Then you got to smack in your pad. But if you had your helmet, he would smack you so hard like he was Ric Flair or something. <laughs> oh, yeah, you bring it up Ric Flair. You're going to get Kevin to talk about wrestling the rest of the time. <laughs> Yeah, styling and profile. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, it's, it's like a Colorado snowstorm. The oh. nature boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, did you play any defense? Yeah, I played corner. So um, let me backtrack. So when I said I played outside linebacker, we were so old school at Aberdeen. That was actually the a corner, but they called it outside linebacker because we was playing like a, <laughs> I don't know, play like an 83 or something. I don't know. Everybody yeah, yeah. had a line of scrimmage back then. But, yeah, I played corner. Um I started at corner from 10th to, to my senior year. So I got recruited as a corner, too, for a lot of schools. You were running both ways. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. we we didn't have a lot of – we we had that many players at Hampton, man. As great as we was, probably had about 30. 30 really? Tops. Yeah. Yeah. It, why is that? Because wow. cause the bullies in the ring probably. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, a lot of kids. Like, why, why, would, why would I go through that? I mean, we got. I, I I give it to you like this: Coach Smith, Coach Man, Coach Mitchell, Coach Gillian, all those guys. They they believe in perfection, and it would rub some young people the wrong way as far as the the attention to detail. Like Coach Smith was ahead of his time. Like we were, <laughs> Monday practices were the worst because. That was game plan, right? That was scouting report. So nowadays you would sit in the classroom and they hand you a bunch of packets, right? Of, you know, the roster, play tendencies, scheme, offensive, defensive, what to look for. You get the whole shebang. Well, back then he had those old like poster boards he used to use for projects, them big mm-hmm. ones. And he and Coach Smith, I mean, Coach Man would laminate the whole thing for him. 
But when you when he turned it around, he had every single play that they ever ran all year and how many times. And he would go through each and every one of them. They were all in. Like right here, right here. Oh, for, for first attend against Ward, they 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 they, they write a pro right. Uh uh, they had number so and so at tailback. They went on 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 two and they ran 42 ISO. Okay, this is how they blocked it. So so he went down here, he went down there, and on second down, they ran this. But on third down, they went right back to that 42 ISO, blocked the same way. And he would just pick up on tendencies. And we were rep probably their big plays over and over, like how they blocked it. We were master how they blocked their plays to where our linebackers like Derek White, Donnell Hollier, they would scream out their plays, like other team plays. It would be the funniest thing. Like teams would line up in their formation and D-White would be like, 46, 46 talks, 46 talks, shift, 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 it's coming. And they'd be like, what the... And lo and behold, the toss and poof, everybody shoot. We went around wide tackle six. And they would just shoot the gap. Poof, go. Check, check, check. Hey, 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 watch the draw, watch the draw. Corners, this back all the way up. What? A draw would come. And back in the day, uh, that, those offenses weren't audibly. They just like, no, call the play in Ottawa. That's what we're doing. Yep. And I'm glad you said it because we had a, we had a computer at quarterback who can Ottawa by the name of Ronald Curry. Mm. We could run to the sideline, coach would be like, Run what you think is best. And he'll come back and he'd be like, all right, so check with me. We either going to run 64 trap or we're going to run 55 to the flanker on on two. Go. And he'd be like, ready. And he'd be like, 64, 64, 64, check, check. And we'll run 64 trap or he'll go, ready, fly, fly, fly. It wouldn't be no tap on the helmet. He'll just say fly and I would take off. Well, y'all, you're kind of calling your shot when you say fly, right? Yeah, and, pe- and everybody knew it was coming to me, too. Yeah. It didn't matter. <laughs> they, could, they couldn't stop it. 4 3 2, gentlemen. 4 3 2. Oh, yeah, no, I was riding out on them. Well, 4 3 2, and, and Ronald's throwing the ball. And his farther, arm, yeah. Yeah, farther than anybody thought he could. <laughs> yeah. And I had the luxury of having Bobby Blizzard inside of me. So the safety had to stay uh-huh. home. I got six foot six tight end who's one of the like, top three in the country. So you couldn't, people yeah. always say, why nobody double teamed you? I was like, because of 89. Then you oh. had Armando Curry on the other side. Or before that was uh, Kenny Crawford. Or before that was Noel Rainey. So a team could never double any of our targets because we had so many weapons. So many weapons. You know, so it made it easy. So many weapons, but only roughly 30 kids on the whole team. Yeah, it wasn't a lot, brother. Yeah, I, I saw I saw Ron Curry and Blizzard. I think their senior year, you you had just graduated, mm-hmm. play against Patrick Henry in the state championship. Yep. Uh, and I saw Blizzard on the field. I'm like, is that kid 30 years old? There's no way that's a 17 or 18 year old kid. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, Bobby was a kid, so Bobby played with me for the Aberdeen Raiders in rec league, and he was six feet, but he was younger. So, you know, he was he was a big kid. Like Bobby was always like very agile. He never played to his size like you saw a big kid you would think he was had to be super physical but he had great feet he had very good speed soft hands like that's what surprised a lot of guys who try to defend him is that they thought it was gonna be a barbarian just lumbering down the field and running to you know he would give you two peaches and he would route you up and they'd be standing there like well, wait a minute you're not supposed to be able to do that so the the success of the Hampton Crabbers sounds like certainly when you were there and it sounds like over coach Smith's tenure there, you guys were tougher. Mm -hmm. You were smarter, better prepared and more athletic. I mean, how how did y'all ever lose a game? We get cheated. (laughs) 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 They get mad at coach Smith for winning so much that they got to cheat you, man. Like my cousin, uh, Sean Hamlet, who went to Florida state, who played free safety at Hampton. The reason why I, I wore number nine at Hampton, their state championship, they got they got kind of cheated versus Garfield. Um, and then the my sophomore year when we lost to D Creek, um, a guy had a dive and catch, but he dropped it, but they counted it as a touchdown. And that's on YouTube. And everybody that I showed it, they was like, that dude did not catch the ball. So they beat us like that. Mm. Um when we lost the next year, the first game of the season versus Kickatan, it was a monsoon, and that just killed us. Like we were just sloppy that game. 
Yeah. But we didn't, after we lost that game my junior year, I ran off 27 straight games. And then Ronald added 14 to that. And then Muffin added 14 to that. So after that Kickatan game in 95, we didn't lose another game for five years. That's crazy. That yeah. is crazy. Well, uh, was it fun beating teams 70 to nothing? Absolutely, because Coach pissed us off all week in practice. <laughs> you know, Coach were dark, run like – I. this is one thing I love about Coach Mann and Coach Mitchell and Coach Smith, because I say all three because they all three play an instrumental part in every practice. It wasn't just Coach Smith. Those two assistants echo and and – carried out his vision to the T like they talk to you respectfully though, but they talk to you like a dog. They prepared you for anybody to say anything crazy to you. They prepared you for anybody that was super physical. They prepared your body to be callous. They prepared you to just be so mentally tough that no matter the situation, you was going to be pissed off at that squad and be like, I know if this game is close and we make too many mental errors, they're going to kick our tails in practice. So we're going to be perfect, and we're going to perfectly kick your tail. Like, we're going to destroy you. And we're not going to act like we were surprised that we did it. We're not going to talk trash before the game. We didn't even talk trash during the game. We just played. A lot of times, if people saw us talking, we couldn't believe that somebody had the audacity to talk trash to us. Like, dude, do you know, like, we would destroy you you keep talking. Like, that's what we would say, like, bro, you really wanted to turn it up? Like, we taking it easy on y'all. And we would just put foot in them. Like, literally, like, destroy teams. Like, just get pissed. I done seen Ronald get pissed off, and he's, he rolled, he rolled off, like, uh, a touchdown run, then an the interception return, then a fumble return. Like, he would just say, I'm going to score this play. I'm going to go get the ball and score again. I'm going to go strip the ball from this guy and score again. That dude was so amazing. He, he can call his touchdown. I've seen him call his touchdown on defense. Oh, they throw the ball. I'm going to pick this and take it to the crib. All right. I watch and he go do it. Mm. Yeah. So when y'all lose a game, uh, when the guy dropped the ball and it counted as a, as a reception, yeah, uh, you had to be just crushed because of everything you, you guys had gone through and it worked so hard for. You. Yeah, man. That was our, so that was my sophomore year and we had went unbeaten. We had beat, you know, tab that year. In a tough game, they had a uh, – I forgot the name of the running back, but he was awesome. But we beat them in the Thriller. We beat uh, Feebas in the Thriller. It was sold out at Darling Stadium, like 9,000 people there. Mm-hmm. And um, we rolling, and we run to D Creek, and they got Arnie Powell. They got Deion Dyer. They got some players over there, man. They running that wing tee. They physical. We physical. So we met somebody just as physical and mentally tough as us, and we get the lead late. Um I run like a, I ran a, I'm going to run a post route and Ron got pressured and I remember him sprinting to the sideline, like coach running again. And he like, Hawk, can you get over again? I was like, we were run the same play. He was like, yeah. So I'm like, yeah, let's run the same play. And I remember he launched it and I caught it in the middle, between the middle of the goalpost. They had the old school goalpost was two mm-hmm. posts and I caught it in the middle of the goalpost to put us up. And then they, the drive kind of stalled, stalled. And then Arnie throws a deep pass and, we were playing cover three, and somehow he got in between our corner. And I, I somebody had Ronald's attention, and it was just a, a good play design that took the attention of both of them, and then he leaked another guy out. So he dove. He had it, but when he hit the ground, it came out. I mean, mm. clear. Like, he caught it, hit the ground, poof, it popped out. And he got up and just celebrated. And uh, we just felt crushed, man. We cried so much because we wanted to win state so bad. And – um. All summer, I mean, from that point on, man, that's all we we like obsessed over winning state that year. So when we lost the kick ten that first game of the season, we were crushed again. And I think is a, a Labor Day was the next day, that Monday. We practiced all day, mm. Mm. all day. We we took a we took a a lunch break. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Labor Day. He took it seriously. We took a lunch break, bro. A lunch break. <laughs> he was like, "All right, take it to the bench." We was like, "Okay, pride is over." Like, don't don't unclip nothing. We got some snacks over there. Got some sandwiches. Give you about thirty minute break, and we're gonna come back and we're gonna do it again. Like, what? 
I mm-hmm. bet you won't lose no more. I'm mm-hmm. like, okay. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> All right. Your fondest memory playing uh, for Hampton football. Oh, man. Um, my fondest memory is my last ever game there versus Patrick Henry at Virginia State. Or was it Virginia Union? I th- ah, it's a good question. I think it was a Union. I think that move, yeah. So Virginia it's a Union. Union is so Patrick Henry. Um, ah, they didn't know what they was getting into. They came out, they face painted, they they holding their hands and they trying to intimidate us, like they was a program or something. Like that was the big defense in. You know, he painted his face. That was back when the program was big. So they come out, and uh, myself, Ronald, Daryl Smith, and uh. Uh, Derek, D uh, D White, Derek White. We the captains, and we going out. So we see them, and they got the kid, the one corner, start with a D that had a bunch of interceptions. Um, real, real good player. So they their captains out, and they bring their whole whole team out, and they look at me like, mm, yeah. <laughs> I mean me, and it's raining hard, and when Ron looks at me, he go. What you think they trying to do? His voice got a little deeper by now. So he's like, hey, Hulk, what you think they trying to do? And back then, I used to curse like a sailor. And I was like, I don't give a F. We're going to F them up, especially all them all them punks with all that paint on their face. I got something for all of them. So Ronald starts laughing because he know how I get when I'm like super angry. He like, and he hit me like, all right, all right, that's enough. So we get close to the refs and we don't want, want nobody. You know, we kids, we want nobody to hear us cursing. And I'm like, I'm talking, I'm cussing, cussing. Like, F this, mother F that, blah, blah, blah. And they just looking at me like, you are? Like, man, it's my last game. Like, I'm letting it all hang out. So coin toss come. I think they win the coin toss, and they wanted the ball first. And we like, y'all think y'all going to score or something? That's what I say. And the, the dude that's their best corner is like, don't worry. You ain't going to do nothing today. I say, oh, <laughs> that. I'm going to kill you. So we 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 hold them. Um, I, I don't, I don't know if Ronald fumbled or something. No, that was the state championship before, but we hold them. They punt. Ronald has a big return, man. He breaks it open. Then we score on a run. Daryl Smith scores. We stop him again. So they punt the ball. We on our own 20. And I remember like it was yesterday. It was like, coach, like what y'all want to run? And I go, Hey man, I got, he got to see me. And I'm pointing at the corner. And Ron like, man, it's pouring down. I'm like, man, you could throw in the rain and I could catch in the rain. Let it fly. Ain't no mud over here or no water. The, the sides were were good, good traction. The middle was puddles. So I was like, man, let's go 55 to the flanker, man. Let, let's chuck it. I need to score because he was talking trash. Ron said, okay. So he dropped back. He threw it. And he's, it's underthrown. So I stop and I catch it. And I'm squared up with the, with the DB. I just give him a quick shake and he just fall down. And that was the last I seen it. I think he got hurt. That was the last I seen him. And then we come right back and run a post corner on who's up out there. So I score back to back. And Ron comes running to me. And he like, man, you in your zone. I was like, I told you you could throw in the ring. <laughs> hey, what was the score at halftime of that game? You remember? I think it was maybe like 35-0. We ended up beating them 51, 51 nothing. So, I, uh, Ahmad, I was at that game. Mm-hmm. I left at halftime because it was 35-0. <laughs> and you know, the game before that, James Monroe or James Madison, they talked trash to us in the paper all week about the thunder and lightning running backs. We beat them 77 to 7. <laughs> and we wanted to score 100 because they was real disrespectful. Well, it's, it sounds like Thunder got in the end zone one time and Lightning maybe didn't do anything. Yeah, Lightning. I'm <laughs> number 33. Yeah, we won. He ended up having over 100 yards. I went back and looked at like stats. I was like, I don't remember him having. 100 yards, but I think the starters were out by the third quarter. But I remember catching him slipping, too, on a on a go route because he was talking trash. I used to take it personal if somebody talked trash. Like, Did you start it or did you just finish the trash? No, I just finished. I never talked trash. Coach wouldn't let us talk trash. But we can, he would always let us finish it, though. He would yes. say, like, Coach Man be like, excuse me, like, damn it, Hawkins. Don't let him talk to you like that. And I'm like, I can say something back. Kick his <laughs> ASS. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I used to be like, come up here. Because nobody played man back then. They all played cover three. And I used to be like, come to the line. Like Chad Johnson, come to the line of scrimmage. Come to the line of scrimmage. You scared. You scared. They said, all right, don't matter. I'm gonna, we just going to throw a screen anyway. And I would catch a quick screen. 
And I would just run right at that DB fast as I could. Like I was a little league. And I'd be like, either you're going to step in front of me and get ran over or you're going to move. And most of the time they would just act like somebody was calling them at the sideline. Hey, you say something? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what, 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 what was that yeah i mean truth be told though how we ran our uh flank of screen it was a quick screen at the line of scrimmage bobby was coming to clean them up and i knew that because mm-hmm. i could just run to them and kind of hesitate and then pow he would ear hole shot them every time mm. so that it doesn't, seem, doesn't seem fair it wasn't play design was great man we, it reminds me of remember the titans we didn't run more than six plays we we were so if it was one play that we had, we could run it to both sides. So we could run 64, 65 trap. We could run 10 and 11 trap was inside traps for Ronald, where he would run basically a delayed quarterback sneak right up the middle and go like 70 yards. Mm-hmm. We would run um 14 and 15 trap out of Veer. We would run option both sides. And then we had quick screen both sides. And then we had a couple pass plays that were different, but nothing was too exotic. It was it was like 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 uh, Denzel said, man, just like Novocaine. Give it time; it'll work. Yeah. <laughs> well, did you watch the uh, Monday night game, the Patriots? Uh, yes. Bills. They yeah. threw the ball three times. Yes. Hey, man, cool. football is a simple game. We just overcomplicate it. <laughs> no, you're right. It's the team that executes their plays the best. That's it, man. Because a lot of times you always hear people say. It ain't about if you know what they're going to run. It's can you stop it? If somebody executes hat on a hat and you got somebody special back there, you can know what's coming. And that's why I tell a lot of fans when I'm recapping games, I'm like, look, man, it ain't about making adjustments. It's when you make the adjustment, can your players adjust? Because they got to make, like, somebody new has to make the play now. Like, you had a game plan where this guy was probably on defense that you trusted that was good in space to make the play but it wasn't working. So you adjusted. Now it's freeing up a different guy to make a play. So can that player now adjust to being the playmaker? Because the offense is getting what they want. They got the ball in their best playmaker hands. How can you devise to get your defensive playmaker involved to where he's always around the ball? And sometimes you got to go to plan B because you're going to use that defensive playmaker as like a, as like bait. Cause you know, two guys going to come at him. It's like, Hey buddy, you have to make the play now. So, that's what I love about football is because you can scheme up and it and it's there. Like you have a guy in the gap with the running back and they won't make the tackle. But you'll hear people say, Man, we need to run something else. I'm like, man, he that kid just getting beat. Yeah. You know? Or oh, that man is just getting beat. And that's what I love about football, man. This as long as you can identify that one guy that can't execute his job, you're gonna be successful. Oh, yeah, you're going to kill him all night. You know, and and sometimes it's not so black and white to we got to run something different. It's like you got – that's why I love about coach in, in high school and the carried over to college with the coach I had in college. It was like, son, you just going to have to make a damn play. <laughs> you know, it's like I don't care what I call, make a play. That was always our approach. Like even if they know it's coming, go make a play. Like they still have to, they still have to execute like you just said. So – that's the thing about sports. It doesn't matter. You can know my whole playbook. Can you stop me? Can you defeat me? Can you get off the block? Can yeah. you make the tackle? Yeah, and sometimes the the tenth or eleventh guy, he, he's critical, and if if he can make the play, yeah, you got a good chance of winning. If he can't, Absolutely, not so much. Man. All right. So when did you know you were going to play college football? Oh man, so. I had aspirations early because my cousin Sean Hamlet was somebody I idolized, and he was at Florida State when I got to Hampton. So I went to all the Florida State games, and I just dreamed about playing for Florida State, playing college ball. And I want to say after my sophomore year, he sees a couple of my film, a couple of my games on film. He like, look, cuz you got a you got a chance to play in college. You just got to keep it up, be more polished. Um, and just don't limit yourself, like show people you can return and stuff like that. So after my junior year, I had a really good year where I had, you know, like 700 yards receiving, but I had like five, 600 yards rushing. So it was like I was returning kicks too for touchdowns. So that's when a lot of college scouts started coming around. And again, he watched my film. He was like, yeah, you ready? Like this summer, really work on your speed and quickness, get stronger. Um, I started running track like 
focusing on track. I stopped playing baseball my junior year and started running track. And um, going to my senior year, man, I, I came in. I was super fit, super strong. I got fast. So that's when I had ran a 10-5. And scouts really started coming around. And I started off that year, like, strong. Like, everything was just explosive plays. And, you know, coach was setting me up. And Ron was getting the ball to me. And all I did in track was carried over to football because I had an, I had another gear that I never had that I was really just getting out on people. And I was physical now to where I could just run through arm tackles. I could put my shoulder down on folks. So I was showing more completeness as a as a runner with the ball, not just a speed guy, that I can go in the hole on the 64 trap and take on the backer and spin out of that and stiff arm somebody. So when when the colleges started calling my big mama house, man, it was – it was surreal, man, because talking to an adult on the phone is different than talking to one of your boys. So it's like, yes, sir, no, sir. And then it's just air because I'm not, don't know what to say. You know, so they're asking you questions like, what do you want to be when you grow up or what you want to major in? I'm like, I don't major. I don't, I was just thinking about football. So that, that broadened it out. I was just a football player. I didn't think about being a student athlete. I did good in high school, though. I, I was an A and B honor roll student, but I never like thought about what I wanted to major in in college. I was just focused on football. That's it. Well, that's how you end up playing Division One football, right? You got to be laser focused. Yeah, I was obsessed with it to where when I got home, if my mama didn't have me cutting the grass or cleaning or something, once the sun went down, I would go back outside and I would jump rope four um, sets of a hundred jumps. If I messed up, I had to start all over. The jumps before didn't count, so I had to do four perfect 100 jumps, and then I was standing at the edge of the driveway, and it was a light pole about 30 yards away, and I would wait for a car to come down the street, and once it got close to where I was at, I would take off and try to beat it. And people yeah. were like, I'm crazy on Big Bethel Road. They were like, who is this kid that's just running from Racing cars. cars. Racing that's cool. cars. And my grandma used to come out and be like, boy, she called me Maude, like, Mart, what are you doing? I like been my mom. Got to make sure like nobody outworking me. That's all I, you know. I stress like I'm gonna outwork the the, you know, the Andre Harrison's that were receiver at at um Ward or Bruce Brant's receiver at Huguenot, David Terrell at Huguenot. Like I knew about all the top guys around Virginia, Virginia Beach or Richmond. So I was like I'm gonna outwork them. Like I didn't have the size of Andre Harrison. I didn't have the route running skills of Bruce Branch or the size and speed of uh, David Terrell at Huguenot. So I had to be like, I'm diminutive. So I got to show I got that dog and that I got something that like I got special attributes that they can't get no matter how hard they work. So that's, that's a great, that's over it. It's a great attitude. I can see why you were successful. So did you get recruited on the offensive side at all? Or was it, how did, how did it turn into DB? Yeah, so I got recruited from uh, – so this is – Well, let, let, let's back up. Who were your top yeah. five teams uh, before you had to declare which school you were going to? Oh, I only had two. Who were the two? It was uh, Florida and Virginia. Hmm. That, that was just my two. I didn't do it five. I only took two visits. That was Virginia and, and Florida. But I got recruited by Ohio State to play running back from the running back film that they got. They saw of me. Cause I wasn't a big guy. So that's back when you had the David Balsons and stuff in college. So like, but they liked me as a running back. They recruited me. A lot of the schools in the Midwest and the big 10, all those schools recruit me at when they saw me playing running back. Cause I played enough running back till I had a lot of film. Um, the schools down South, like the Florida's, the Georgia's, um, those schools recruited me for DB and then Virginia, Virginia tech, um, East Carolina, they recruited me as a receiver. So it was like, it depends on what, what part of the country you were in, what I was to, you know, how it was viewed. So two visits, you only took two visits, only UVA two and Florida. Yep. And how in the world would you pick UVA over Florida? Over Florida. I'm just thinking. I don't know. You know what I'm thinking. Are you, so, are you, yeah, ta- are you yeah. talking smack right now? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Because no, at that time, Florida won a national championship that year. 
So here's how I didn't go to Florida, because I was set to go to Florida. Everybody in Hampton knew I was going to go to Florida. Everybody knew that I was going to be a Florida Gator. My cousin went to Florida State. He told me, well, they didn't really recruit me that hard. They sent, matter of fact, they didn't recruit me. They sent me a questionnaire just because he asked them to. So they didn't recruit me. So Florida starts recruiting me heavy. Like Steve Spur and his coaches are calling me heavy. And when I visit, visited them, um, they, I mean, that was a great visit, man. How they, like, they take you to the swamp. They got your jersey. They got this jumbo, you know, name on the Jumbotron. And then Spurs on the 50-yard line. It's like 12 o'clock noon. Hot as hell. He on the bike. And you walk out and you meet him. And he talked to you. And he, you know, I'm excited for you to come here. Because by that time, I was, they knew I wanted to come there. So, I meet with the receiver coach, and I'll never forget this. He's like, yeah, you know, we got great receivers because Jacques Green was my host. We got great receivers, you know, the receivers that we have. Jacques Green around your size, but I'm going to tell you this. You're going to play defense for us. I was like, what? Like, yeah, you're going to play defense for us because we're going to keep recruiting receivers better than you, but you can play receiver for us. We see that. you fast. You got good feet. I don't think you realize how good you can be as a DB. Don't get discouraged, but you're going to be a DB down here uh, for the Florida Gators. So I was just like, okay. So when I got in that plane going home, I'm just like, I don't How are you just going to tell me? I don't want to play DB. I want to play receiver. They didn't know that. It wasn't like I was telling them that, but in my head, I don't, I don't want to go to Florida. So I remember getting home and my big mama asked me how the trip was. I was like, I don't know about the trip. And um, Monday, I get a call from Virginia from Danny Wilmer and crew and like coach Walsh want to do a home visit. I was like, all right, he come down. This is after we won state and stuff. So he comes down, he talks to me, big mama, let him sit on a, a good front of the, so in the African-American household, when you stay with your grandmother, you got the, the, the living room where it's all the nice furniture with plastic around it. And you got the plastic runner rug. You got the nice dining table. You got the nice china. You got the pictures of all the kids and all the grandbabies. Don't nobody go in that damn room unless it's <laughs> unless it's Sunday dinner or it's Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving. it's Christmas. Yeah. He said, oh, how you doing? First of all, George, how you doing, George? Matter of fact, go sit in the living room. Sit right there in the, in the solo seat, which was her seat. So she let Coach Well sit in her seat in the living room on the nice front of you. So as he sits there and Tom O'Brien sits on the love seat, I look at the couch and I look at her and I look at the floor. I'm like, so can I go in or you going to make me stand in the hallway and talk to them? <laughs> so she just put her hand on the, uh, the, uh, the lower of my back, the small part of my back, and kind of just nudged me. So I'm like, I just feel like the Holy Spirit just go, ooh, I'm here. You know what I'm saying? God opened up the gates. So uh, I sit down, I talk to Coach Wells, and Coach Wells is just so matter of fact. He was like, yeah, um, we like you. You're explosive. And I'm like, Coach, where you got me playing? <laughs> Receiver, where else will we put you? <laughs> Have you seen your film? <laughs> you're a fool to put you anywhere else. <laughs> Are you kidding me? How about you, Tom? Tom's like, before Tom gave an answer, <laughs> well, he agrees. <laughs> and then Big Mama comes around, and she got Sweet potato pie form, some some North Carolina gray barbecue, not the red barbecue, the gray barbecue. The vinegar some, vinegar barbecue. Yeah, right? vinegar barbecue yeah. with the collard greens that's diced up real, real, cut real fine. And she offered him something to eat. She offered him sweet potato pie. And she don't get everybody the North Carolina barbecue. She mm. like she keep that low in the deep freezer. The deep freezer downstairs in the garage. And she got to go all the way down to get that out. Because they they that come from the pig that you roast when you bury it underground mm. overnight. You know what I'm saying? That type of I'm from that's, my that's people good from stuff. Roanoke. Yeah, my people from Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. They know how to get down with that pig. Every part. So <laughs> every he, part. No, nothing goes yeah. to waste. Yeah, no, no. Nothing. Nothing. Hooves, ears, nose, n- nothing. Ugh. Do you, you like do you like scrapple? Do you like Scrapple, Lamont? I, I got to say, yeah, because I'll be disrespected a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, wouldn't eat it now, but I, I used to tear it up when she gave it to me. But so George goes, Coach Wells goes through his, he's just talking to me regular. And 
he leaves, and Ben Mama goes, I like that old George. He want he because Coach talked about me being becoming a better man and being successful outside of this game of football. You know, get my degree from UVA and what it can do for me, being that I'm, that I'm a Virginia kid. And um, she's like, so what you thinking? And I was like, but mom, you know I want to be a Florida Gator. I just don't like how they want might want me to switch positions. She go, go to that Charlotte. Where where is that school at? And I was like Charlottesville. And we the back then we go look at the map and it's, we see how far it's, far it is. She was like, oh, I could make that drive, baby. That's where you need to go. Just go there. So big mama come see you play. Cause that Florida, I don't like planes. And I don't trust this TV. So why don't you go down there with George? He seemed nice. He wants you to be a, a better man. I trust him with you. Go down there. So we're I'm about to call um my mom and my dad and just say, you know what? I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Virginia because Big Mama just laid down the law. I'm not gonna go go against her. When I pick up the phone. I hear, hello? I'm like, who? Hello? They're like, yeah, Ahmad, this is Coach. <laughs> I seem to have forgot my keys. <laughs> <laughs> so he had to come back and get his keys because Obi was driving, but he couldn't find his keys. And I just remember my mom was like, yeah, I think my baby going to come up there, but I'm going to let him make it official in the way he's supposed to make it official. But I trust him with you. And he was like, really? He was like, <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to it then. So I ended up making two days later, because I had already been down there. Two days later, I, when I come to sign it, we had our little signing day at Hampton. Everybody's thinking I'm going to Florida. Everybody. Everybody. And back then, we didn't do the hats, the shirts, none of that BS. You had your coach, all whoever the seniors were, and the letter of intent. And you and you just, sign, you know, decided and stuff like that. So I was like, where you going? I was like, I'm going to go to UVA. And everybody was like, whoa, wait a minute. What? You're not going to Florida? I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to UVA. And Coach Smith was hyped because Aaron Money had been there. Like, so many UVA guys have been there before me. So he was hyped. And Ron was was su- surprised because like, everybody was going to be able to get everybody. Well, I'm very glad you chose UVA. And by the way, if, if I'm a coach and, and a big part of my job is recruiting, I don't think I'm telling a kid – who's a senior in high school, hey, we know which position you should be playing because you're going to yeah. turn those kids off, right? Yeah. It, and, yeah, and I and I, I know where the, the coach was coming from as far as we're going to recruit somebody better than you because he's just saying that's competition. Our goal is to find somebody better than you and find somebody better than him. And But I guess I was so, like, used to being – my ego being boosted up that – I wasn't ready for those real conversations because what he said wasn't wrong. Like that's competition. You know what I'm saying? And that did drive me to make sure when I got to UVA to always know they probably recruiting people better than me. So I got to make sure I'm getting better each summer. So him telling me that was a spark. I needed to go into college and maintain that same drive I had when I was racing cars on big buck the road. Yeah, I I hear you. It it all makes sense now, right? We, we yeah, live now a lot it does. Life, but when you're 17, 18 years old, oh, you no, it didn't make no that. sense. No, it, yeah. make, it pissed me yeah. off. Right. It, I mean, they they lost a, a hell of a player that day. Yeah, yeah, they did. And I and I think it, the universe will make mistake. I think going down to Florida, I've been lost in the translation because you are appreciated when you stay in state and go to your, a school that that's in the state you grew up in. You really are, and it's not like a plug for any of these kids to start going back to Virginia, Virginia Tech, but it's a different type. It's a special type of love when you go to one of these universities that's in the same state you grew up in. No, I, I'm with you. I, I, I don't understand it because I didn't experience it, but yeah, there's got to be something to uh, having family be able to come to your game. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. All right. So the last time UVA beat Virginia Tech <laughs> in Blacksburg was your second year. Yeah, my second year. So we beat them our first year. 97, we beat them 31 to 7. And then the second year we came back. Yeah. And so uh when when I Googled you, and I've Googled you a couple of times, the the picture that we you you and I can see and Kevin can see is uh your arms outreach. You've got the, the ball in your right hand, you're you're facing the sky. What had happened just before that picture was taken? Yeah, man. So we have we was making a, a drive from like the four yard line and we was running the same play. It was like mirrored 
um, bench routes with a wide option to our, to our tight end because they was playing a wide tackle six. They was playing strong, man. And I wasn't in the game the first four plays of that drive. Kevin Coffey had his contact pop out, and I just ran in the game. I don't I don't know if they could have called a timeout or they could have got his contact back in, but I just shoot in the game because I was the third receiver in the three receiver set, but I was next up if one of the two main guys went down. And I'm running the game. I had just dropped the touchdown pass versus UNC the week before, and I hadn't touched the ball all game. And um, we called the same play, and Brooks stops me last breaking the huddle. He's like, Hawk, I'm going to come to you. And I'm like, why? He was mm-hmm. like, they going to single coverage you. They're going to shade to T. Wilk. T. Wilk had like 130 yards, I think. Terrence Wilkins, and he's like, you're going to be one-on-one, you to the field. Just just, just run the route. I'll get the ball to you. I'm like, okay. So I run my route, and it's not a very good bench route. Anthony Midget reads it. Um, he breaks downhill before I come out my break. So I'm thinking, okay, Aaron's not going to throw me the ball. So I come out my break kind of lazy because, you know, he's breaking on it so hard. I'm like, ain't no way he's going to throw it to me. He's screaming. So I turn, and I'm just here. I hear a wh- whistle, loud whistle. And then I see a white sleeve come in front of my face in this midget's arm. This, and the ball's coming. I'm like, oh, the ball's coming. And then when he puts his arm up, I can't see the ball anymore. So I'm like, damn. He must have, and before I get it, must have, I hear pink, and I just trap the sound. I just hear pink, and my right hand goes up to my face mask, and I trap it. Like, both hands go up, but my right hand really touches the ball. Richmond Times Dispatch has an old pitch. I got I got that picture downstairs, and I'm catching it. You can see me trap it with my right hand. And I take it for, with my right hand, and I just fork it like Coach Mann taught me in high school. And once I turn in my head, and I got a couple pitches, I'm smiling because I'm like, none of these – like, I go back to my high school, they're like, none of these dudes going to catch me. Like, I'm laughing because I see guys – hustling and i'm just like <laughs> this game over y'all been talking all this trash it's been about three fights i'm running down and i just i'm laughing bro like i'm hysterically laughing like we about to come back and beat them and i'm about to score the winning touchdown and when i get to the goal line something just hits me it's like Naylor and ron not here my two cousins were supposed to come to that game and they got murdered a oh. year mm-hmm. so something just dropped me down on my knees so when i'm on my knees right here and i'm looking to the sky i don't hear anybody i'm just thanking them and saying like this is for you so that poses for my two deceased cousins so mm-hmm. that's why i love that it became like something that people call iconic because this reminds me of them you know what i'm saying so that pose had nothing to do with football and i'm glad they didn't throw an unsportsmanlike conduct on me for that but i stayed down there for quite a minute and i couldn't hear nothing i was just talking to them in the sky and i remember getting up i did do the uh slash on the throat running off the field um but yeah so you didn't get a flag for the slash on the throat no i didn't get it i didn't get a flag man they were lenient back then you could do anything in the end zone back, back in those <laughs> days <laughs> I, I i had no idea you'd had such uh loss in your life um uh, before you scored that touchdown. That's yeah, uh, man. That's it went story. Through, I went through a lot. Um, cause I had tore my ankle up and had to have major surgery after I scored against Florida state, my freshman year against Maryland in November of 97. And I was still rehabbing. I remember getting my pen out and I got the news from one of my friends from Hampton that didn't know that those two gentlemen were my, my cousin. So she was like, you know Chanel and Saron Gibson? And I'm about to be like, yeah, they my cousins. If I could get they my cousins out. She was like, man, some dude shot them. They got murdered. 15 shots and 14 shots in the other one. And I just broke down the tears. I was on crutches. Mm. And I just, whew, in the elevator. And she's like, what the hell is wrong with you? And I remember Womack saying, yo, those are his cousins. You just told him his cousins got murdered. Like, wow. non- like nonchalant, because she didn't know. No. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a rough. That, that year was rough for me, because I never dealt with surgery and then I never dealt with death like that. So that 9 season was a trying time for me. I dropped a lot of passes that year too. And um, to catch that one from Aaron, his last throw as a UVA quarterback in the regular season before the bowl game. Um, and then Dex, his legendary speech at halftime with his torn up knee 
usually, you know, injured players don't travel with George and George let Dex travel and for him to inspire us. And then how we came back in the second half was just magical, man. It started with buying three. You know, we were stinking it up as an offense and the defense is like, you know what, I'm a, we're going to go score. So he scored and then we was like, all right, we got to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, let's transition. That was Poindexter's last season, right? Yes. Was, yep. that, was, that was his last year. And, last he, year. and which game did he get hurt in? Versus um, NC State. It was like the last – it was a full quarter – and it wasn't too much time left in the game. And the receiver just ran like his leg was locked and the receiver slipped awkwardly on our sideline. And he hit Dex and Dex just slammed his helmet down. I was like, yeah, I'm done. I'm done. My knee's gone. I'm done. I remember that. He was like, I'm done. I'm done. Mm. I'm done. He walked off like he hobbled off. And he didn't sit down. He, he They just went straight to the locker room. Mm. And he came yeah. back on crutches. Yeah, I, it's one of those injuries that I, I can't watch the video of it. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's it's that bad. It's freakish. Yeah. All right. So I bring up Anthony because uh, he got into coaching after he played for a bit, and yeah. uh, I mean he was the the lead candidate for the UVA head coaching job. Well, let's let's back up. Yeah. We had to reschedule from last a week ago because, because of that. Yeah. Because Bronco <laughs> announced that he was basically yeah. uh, leaving the position and and you said hey i got some obligations i gotta attend to do you yeah. can we reschedule and i'm like of Crazy. course because i i'd read the news like 20 minutes before you texted me yeah and, and i'm like I, i'm i'm expecting uh ahmad to text me any minute now uh it, but so it's been a week and we and we don't have a coach no we don't and, and i and i really wanted anthony to be the guy i really did yeah that's that you know nostalgia reasons um his character just knowing him personally, just knowing how great of a player he was. It's it's that movie or TV series type of feel, man. It's not saying he's not capable, but it's just one of the things that we love Dex so much that we just wanted it so bad. And I didn't – I mean, selfishly, I didn't care about his resume. I didn't care about ready, not ready, because you never know if you're ready until you provide an opportunity. But, yeah, that was, that was a lot of the uh, – I say backlash because folks didn't know how to deal with former players being disappointed that Dex wasn't the coach. And it made it seem like we was going to despise anybody else that was hired. And that's not the thing. It's like you let humans process a disappointment and then they could transition. Cause you could have both. You could be disappointed in something and still support something that could happen at the same time. But a lot of folks want things to be mutually exclusive. So um, when a lot of my buddies came in my, um, Twitter space and we're just voicing their disappointment. A lot of fans thought they were bashing the the newer candidate, which was Tony Elliott. And that wasn't the case. It was just those guys loving Dak so much that it was no different than when Bronco stepped down. The guys that love him were just like, what are you doing? Like, we need you. Don't do this. Like, that's just, that's just human reaction, you know? And um, the only thing that's disheartening about all the backlash is, Folks won't allow an athlete to have a human reaction, which is sad. Yeah. You know, they're like, you guys are better than that. You shouldn't do that because of who you are. It's like, but I'm human. Right. <laughs> I'm yeah, wh human. Why are the rules different for athletes? It doesn't make any sense. It yeah. doesn't. And they, they hold you at this high regard. And sometimes it just sucks to be held at that high regard because it's like, bro, I'm a, I, I'm human. I'm a mess up just like you. Just like you. Hey, just like Barkley said, man, you, your, your role model should be your parents. Definitely. And your grandparents, not not Definitely. athletes. So let me ask you this, Ahmad. We talked to Dwight um, Dwight Vick a little bit about the relationship between the former players at Tech and the, and the coaching staff. And he said there had been a little bit of a rift in the past few years, and they're trying to – obviously now they're going through the same thing guy, that you guys were, or at least they were until they, they hired the Penn State guy. Um, how is the relationship there at UVA between – or how was it, I guess, between the staff of Bronco and, and the former players like yourself or, or other guys that had played there? Yeah, that's a great question. So I feel like I'm an outlier because I'm a part of the media and I live here in Charlottesville. I built a great relationship with each and every one of those guys on staff. So me personally, I had a relationship with all of them. And I think that's why the Bronco stepping down, it was hard on me because Bronco is a friend of mine. Like, I don't talk to him about football i talked to him about life and he you know i asked me hey go check this book out you know 
and read that and then tell me what you think, like stuff on leadership and just being a better man. So when he stepped down and just seeing his body language, I kind of was like, damn, Bronco just, that's just the universe telling him to step away. Like every time we want to find a reason. But to answer your question, as far as former players, I felt like Bronco opened the door wide open for them to come in, whether it's getting a sideline pass, whether it was talk to the team, whether it was watching practice. I can't speak to how their relationship was with each coach. Um, I know, you know, of course, Marcus Hagens has a relationship with all the former players. He's a former player. But I know that um, Ray Roberts had a great relationship with Coach 2J um, that I know of. And uh, Coach Ottawa, the running backs coach, everybody loved him. Uh, Vic uh, Soto, before he went to USC, all the former players used to vibe with him a lot. So, you know, like I said, I had a great relationship with each and every one of them, but I can't pinpoint which guys had relationships with, with, with coaches, and I can't really speak to if how close they was to Bronco, right. but Bronco bridged that gap. He repaired the bridge between the university and our program to the alumni. He did that because it was fractured. It was tough to for guys to get like access. I'm going to just put it wow. like that. And I don't know who made it tough. Not pointing the finger at anybody, but I know Bronco came in and demolished that iffy and made it guaranteed that a former player, what you need, you want to come to a practice, practice. You need sideline pass, sideline pass. How many tickets you need, get them tickets. You need some gear, get them some gear. You want to talk to the team, you want to talk to which player, get them their number. That was never an issue, and that's what I loved about them. Well, they let they let our buddy Jay Strath lead the team out holding a flag this season at one point. Yep. So if they'll let him do that, then they must that have was dope too, man. They did that on the away games too. You know what I'm saying? Oh, like that, that was a great thing, man. Just honoring our past greats who who paid the way for us, man. That, that's a beautiful thing, man. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah. All right. You, you mentioned Ray Roberts. Ray uh, graduated the same year I did, and, and Ray and I did not know each other, but we did play a pickup basketball game against me. Uh -huh. I, do you know Ray pretty well? Yeah, I know Ray good. <laughs> yeah. So, so Ray, uh, I, I'm the tallest dude on my my team. Uh, Ray's Ray's about my height, and Ray is taking me inside, and I can't do anything. And, and he's kind of like a, a a dancing bear. Like mm -hmm. I, I couldn't do anything with him, even if he was half his size, but his his height. I, yeah. I still couldn't have stopped him. He, he just had too many moves. And about halfway through the game, I said, Ray, can you please go outside? You're killing me inside. Y'all going to win anyway. Just just play outside. Yeah. And, and I had no idea he could he could shoot. Yeah, he could hoop, he start, man. He started dropping threes on me like it was nothing. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, never mind. You, you just do whatever you're going to do, and I can't stop it. It is what it is. I couldn't believe he was that athletic at that size. I could not yeah, believe it. When you play off as a tackle, you got to be athletic because you got to kick slide and go against those athletic ends with that speed and try to run the hump. I always say this lineman always got very good feet and then more nimble than what you think they are, you know, especially guys that got to pull and do do those athletic things like Elton Elton Brown the same way and um, Morgan Moses was like that. Morgan so, Moses. Richard Ferguson, huge. those guys, man. Yeah, yeah. Huge. <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, so look, I watched the the tech game this year, and mm -hmm. like our offense can be electric. Yep. Uh, what is going on with our defense? Yeah, man. That's I. Uh, you know, they 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 switched up the scheme to a three three five, and that's something that they really did master as a staff, in my opinion. They mastered running the three four, and running the nickel, or the two four five. Like they knew that, like the back of their hand. But you know, like when you coach football, you could put in a new scheme but if you haven't mastered it when it comes to certain game time situations what is your muscle memory like as a as a player muscle memory kicks in as far as like your technique and your break you're not going to be hesitant because you've mastered situations it's the same way in play call in my opinion offensively or defensively when it get time get tough you know exactly what you're going to go to and I felt like in that scheme we wasn't fully confident in what we wanted to like they knew what they wanted to go to but it's like mm, can they execute that you know i'm i'm gonna do this can you execute and a lot of times it just seemed like the players didn't master that that scheme because it was times that it'd be an unblocked defender and it just wouldn't go all the way in the gap like i remember when the the, no, the notre dame game is like fourth and one and the safety is in the weak side a gap and instead of being zero Right there in the line of scrimmage, he's at one yard. 
before he tries to attack the running back. But I feel like if he mastered that scheme and what was asked of him, he would have just shot the gap and would have been in the backfield. And I think at times, like versus Virginia Tech on that deep pass play they had, the coverage we had called was perfect. But it was the instances where guys were being robots and not a football player. And what I mean by that is we was playing man-to-man. They had a tight, tight end to the boundary. They had a tight end to the field. Then they had two receivers. And they was running an over concept where everybody was dragging across the field. But the nearest tight end was blocking because it was like a max pro. And the corner was free to take that over route because his guy stayed in. So he, And he did that. AJ looked for work. We had a, a overhang safety because we're in the three three five, so we got an extra extra DB. The overhang safety, well, he's looking for the tight end, so he takes him. So the free safety sees the tight end, and for some reason, he goes and takes him. Versus <laughs> pre-snap, you could read and say, oh, I got to close in. Hey, overhang, check this. Now I can help this slot, or I can help. I could just play these two receivers because you two guys could take those two guys down no matter what. Especially if he blocked now, y'all could be on that guy. And they run a post route with the slot, and our nickelback is already outside shade, so he's beat by alignment. So that's why I was like, man, if you master that scheme and that coverage, that runs – it ran into what was called, but we didn't execute like we should have because that play would have ran right into our free safety. Like, you're there. The outside guy ran a, just a 10-yard or five-yard hitch. So it was a one-man route. And we had three guys essentially on the dummy route. And our nickelback gets beat. So a lot of times when I'm breaking down the film, I'm like, that's the scheme. Like the scheme, they they weren't comfortable executing the scheme. But I feel like if you go back to what you were doing, even if you're getting beat, certain tight situations, your mastery is going to kick in. It's yeah, almost like uh, in, involuntarily you, you you end up doing the right thing just because you practice it so much you, you've mastered yeah. it and you don't yep. have to think about it. Right? Yeah. Like and a lot of times we were thinking in a three three five, and when you you know in football when you thinking you losing. Yeah. <laughs> you got to react and go. Yeah, yeah you got to trust your instincts. Absolutely. And trust and trust your practice. Yeah. Hey, so uh, you ended up playing wide receiver for the first three years, and, yeah. and then you, you transitioned to DB. What what was that process like? Yeah, I was on my – I'm going to play both ways because we didn't have a lot of DBs tips. So I went in the coaches. I said, hey, Coach Wells, man, I'm thinking about – I want to play some defensive back. We ain't got a lot of DBs. We got a lot of talent receiver. Billy ba- – I mean, Billy McMullen is going to be a star. He's breathing down my damn neck. And I ain't going to be one of those older guys that just say, hey, I got seniority. I can help this guy get on the field more if I just play both ways and still play some slot. Like, I did – it didn't bother me because I wanted to just create more opportunity for me on the next level. And coach was like, all right, we'll let you play some DB, some DB in the spring. So I start out at, uh, at DB and I never got the chance to go back. Mm. Coach was like, wait a minute, Christ. Hey, <laughs> you're pretty good at this. <laughs> hey, Rick, <laughs> what are you thinking? Where is he at on the depth chart? And Rick was like, hey, baby, he's the, he's the top guy on that side. On the right side, he's our he's the top corner. <laughs> You're not catching any more balls unless you get interceptions, and that'll be good. <laughs> so I stayed at corner. <laughs> were, were you happy about that? Yeah, I was. I was ecstatic, man. I was ecstatic because I just felt like I could help the team out even more. And then the the world could see Billy McMullen, and did he come out roaring? Like that was just me. That was just I had talked to my mom and I prayed on it. And I talked to Big Mama, cause I like I said I struggled, man. I, like I was just struggling. I just needed a new identity. Even in '99, I struggled with drop balls, and I just needed like a new identity. Like when it came to crunch time, I'll make the catches, but it was times that I was just dropping deep balls when I had people beat, and my confidence was a little shot. And I was just like, "Yo, man, I can't go out like this." I, and the door opened for me to play DB, and I did. I did well, man. I was. Did- you know, third in ACC in picks. Um, I was getting matched up on guys like Corn Robinson and Rod Gardner, and doing. What I picked off Phillip Rivers for my last ever play at Scott Stadium to seal the game. So it worked out well. Picked off Chris Winky. So I picked off Woody Dancer 
up for the Heisman, picked off Chris Winkie for the Heisman, picked off Philip Rivers, a future NFL star. Um, so the guys that I picked off were legit guys. I had I picked off a guy in Maryland. Nobody knows him, but I'm just saying, like a lot of my picks were against guy Rod Gardner. I was checking him pick pick that off. Checking Snoop Menace picked off Chris Winkie. Checking Corn Robinson picked off Philip Rivers. So it wasn't like I was just picking off bums. Did the uh did the Florida coach call you and go, I told you so? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he probably he probably <laughs> <laughs> nobody ever asked me that he probably was like i told that boy and you know what my dad said the same thing my dad was like boy you should have played I, a lot of people said that to my, my senior year and i think that was just a humbling like congratulatory gesture by them that they was like man you should have been playing corner the whole time man you probably would have you know really got drafted because you did so well in that short period of time with the transition like we were playing a lot of man and i was coming up tackling I wasn't just a cover guy. Like I was, I could be physical and hit you. I could jam you. I was, I was a smaller guy, but I didn't play to my size. Like I would, I mean, I watched deck, so I would come and try to bite your face off and hit you. Sometimes hey, it didn't work out though. Hey, so well, you you are smaller and, and <laughs> yeah, physics is a thing. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you you got a lot going on these days. Mm-hmm. During the football season, walk me through a typical week for you. Ooh, is shout out to my wife because <clears throat> she tolerates this. Um, so Mondays I usually record the walkthrough with with Luke Goldstein from the video department at UVA, where we similar to Jay Billis. Uh, what is there? What is ninety four feet? Ninety four feet. Yeah, ninety four yeah. feet. So we got the idea for him. We did it for football since we wear helmets, and this was like four years ago. They came up with the idea on a whim, and it went through. So this was our fourth season, and um. So I, I take that and we usually get that in one take. I don't usually mess up a lot on that because the guys are so open to just laugh and joke with me. Um, so I tape that on Monday. Usually Sundays I do my recaps. I look at film early. So Saturday's a game. Sunday I get up at like six. I get the cut ups for the game. So I'll take about an hour and a half of offense, take a break, then do an hour and a half of defense to make sure I get everything right that I talk about as far as what went wrong and top plays and things like that. So I'll record that Sunday. Monday, I do the walkthrough. Um, Tuesday, I was hosting the Coach's Corner with Bronco. Wednesday, I will record the Locker Room Assets um, hosted by Tony Covington and myself, and we bring on former players or administrators or coaches, and that's available on Locker Room Access. Then Thursday, I would do the preview of our opponent, and then I will also record uh, Red Diamonds, Coffee and Tea Morning Brew, little plug, and I'll do the weekly ma- key matchup that people see on Twitter. Friday's a day I get to just spend with my wife and kids, unless it's a away game, then I got to travel. Um, um, and then Saturday, I got to be at the stadium three and a half hours, no, three hours early, three hours before kickoff. And what are you doing during the during – the game so before I, before and during the game yeah we do our run through rehearsals for the in stadium um festivity so i do a um pre-game matchup so what they see on twitter i reenact in the stadium but it's a the video is a little longer so i do a key matchup where we get on who vision and i show you various plays and what to look for whether it's offense defense um just what to look for and I walk people through that, but they visually get to see it. And I try to get the crowd hype at the end. And then if we have some presentations to a player, I may introduce them. Um, and then at halftime, I, I'm like, I'm going to get my Chris Berman on. I get to do some halftime highlights, some voiceovers, and talk about some key plays. Um, the only game that was tough this year to do at halftime was Notre Dame because we didn't really score any touchdowns so that <laughs> was a tough half time <laughs> but and then post game i go in in the back and i don't have a lot of post game duties anymore because um, i'm not i didn't do any sideline this year if i was doing sideline then i would have to do post game pressers and sideline reporter gets the first dibs on bronco to ask your four or five questions so um but yeah man that's my my week and it's a whirlwind because it's constantly going so when the season was over, I was like, <sighs> and then Twitter spaces picked up. 
Twi- Twitter's been going nuts. I, I, you have to love that. Though. Yeah. Every, every week has to be a blast for you. It's a blast for me, man. It's truly a blessing. Um, like I'm forever in debt by the university, just allowing me to be a part of the university up close and personal and trusting me to be an ambassador, trusting me and allowing me to come to pride this understanding that I won't share anything that I see as far as like the hardest thing for me was when I knew Brendan was going to play versus Pitt the whole time and people were asking me and I can't tell them. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's been a lot of other breaking news that I knew that I don't tell because when I go to practice, I'm going to practice as a, as a former player. And I always tell the coaches, I'm not media around y'all. So if you tell me something, I'm never going to share it. And I haven't. Since Broncos been here, I've never shared anything on air. And then I think they respected that and they loved that because I had Coach Ottawa say that. He was like, man, you know, you're a real one. Like, you've never shared anything that we've said to you to try to get that one up of being like the breaking news. I'm not a breaking news guy. I leave that to the, the, the real journalist. I'm a podcaster. I just I'm a recapper and I'm a previewer. That's my so role. The, so the new coach for UVA is gonna be who? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think he actually does. <laughs> I, I recap. So I'm a recapper, man. Like I I recap what I read. Like if you drop an article, I'll discuss the article. If you drop yeah, a tweet, I'm I'll discuss a tweet. That's my lane. I always tell folks, I may know information, and unless somebody said, Hulk, share this, I'll share yeah. it. But no, that's good. If I know something, because I don't want to be, I, I couldn't be Jerry Radcliffe right now, man. That's my guy. I couldn't be him. Because when he said it was imminent that Dex was coming, I was like, whoa, Jerry. That's, that's who I'm talking about. And then, you know, when the cap texted me, it was like, love you, brother, but I'm going to stay at Penn State. I said, MF and Jerry. Wait until I. <laughs> 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 that's Look great. Jerry Radcliffe, man. Hey, you know, when you get Ronald Curry on your podcast and he tells a story why he went to UNC, can I be there? Man, I think he's gonna leave that for the big boys. He ain't gonna we got the same agent, but I don't think I I you know what? I wouldn't even man, I could, but I I don't even know if I want all that that traffic. Because <laughs> it's gonna be a lot of you been a dick curry. Oh, we hate you. I don't want that energy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we, we got two things we end each podcast with. One is uh, tell us about your family a little bit. Oh, man. I've been married to my wife for 16 years. Yes. Love every minute of it. And she, she usually in the same, you know, my bedroom's my studio, the corner of it. She's not here right now, but um, she has helped shape me into a very uh, logical and thoughtful person because I used to be a very um, explicit hothead. Like every other word was a curse word. And if Coach was alive, he would confirm that. Um, <laughs> she has calmed me down a lot. She has helped me be thoughtful now when I speak with folks and be patient with people. And that's definitely helped me out in life. Um, and then my two kids, my daughter, Caden, she's 15. And then my son, Ahmad Jr., who I didn't want to have my last name, my, my first name be my namesake, but I'm, I'm proud that he's named after me. He's 11 and they're both just, just great, great kids. They listen. Um, they could be kids and be difficult, but they're just great, man. They, they compete in, um, soccer track and my son also plays football. And that's what I look forward to when the season's over. Like during the season, I, I met, I may miss some, some of their games, but on Sundays I can go to their soccer games or his football game. I coached them in football, but, um, like now, I'm just trying. I'm looking forward to just them telling me to get the hell away from them because I'm gonna be just crowding their space now because daddy don't have so many obligations. And yeah. that's the best thing about football winding down. I used to do basketball when Ty Jerome was here. I was real close with Ty Jerome, but I had to take a step back because it was kind of driving a riff between me and my loved ones because I was just so, I, I really consumed myself when I'm doing something like I want to make sure I'm doing it right. I'm not just doing it just to do it. So it's good. Well, yeah. f- football and basketball is a lot. Uh, so when you're in the house, it's just the four of y'all. W- mm-hmm. what, what name do you go by? And what does Ahmad junior go by? Um, we call him Rashad. Our, our middle name is Rashad. So we call him Rashad. 
Okay. If we're in trouble, it's Ahmad Jr. and Ahmad Senior. <laughs> if we're like Ahmad that. Senior or Ahmad Jr., we in trouble. <laughs> if it starts with Ahmad, you know something's coming. Yeah, somebody in trouble. We hear uh, mom, like, oh, what did I do? And she's like, Junior, I'm like, yes. Whoa, wait a minute. Don't you ain't too mad at her. Uh, and then we got two chihuahuas. Um, one of our first chihuahua was supposed to have been a lap dog, but he ended up being big enough to be just right to sit on my lap. And now my wife got a real little chihuahua, so they both keep us keep us going. I never thought I would have two chihuahuas, but they my one of them actually right here. He, he's always in the oldest one's always by me when I'm recording. So what, what uh, are their names? Che- <laughs> Chewbacca from Star Wars and Gizmo from the Gremlins. Okay, all right. Nice. Gizmo is all black, and Chewbacca, Chewbacca, Chewy looks just like Chewbacca. Like his coat looks just like Chewy. Wow. S- sounds like two perfect names. Yeah, all right, Kevin, hit him with your la- oh, like all chihuahuas. <laughs> all right, Kevin, hit him with with your last question. All right, Amaya, you ready for this? Yes, sir. All right. So you are a late night host tonight. One night. Okay. You got one night to be a late night host. You get to pick a male guest, a female guest, a musical group, and a <laughs> comedian. And you can go for a mod's favorites. You can have a great grandparent, dead or alive. You can have anybody you want. You can go for ratings, or this can just be the Ahmad Hawkins favorite show. Oh, so male, female, music, and comedian. Uh, so, my comedian, I'm going to have, see. It, this is funny because both of the guys I'm gonna choose, I gotta make one a comedian and one just a guest. You'll like this. Martin Lawrence is gonna be my comedian. My in Martin Lawrence is gonna be my comedian. My male guest is gonna be Kevin Hart. Mm. Cause I just wanna sit and talk and joke back and forth and have banter with him. Now my female guest, now this is where it gets dicey. Cause I <laughs> I used to love Tyra Banks growing up, but if I say Tyra, I could get in trouble. So I got to say Holly Berry because my wife likes Holly Berry also. So I'm going to say Holly Berry for the female. Yeah, now, musical guest, I got to bring him back from the grave. I'm saying Tupac Shakur. I got to have mm-hmm. Tupac there. Yeah. That's a good show. Yeah. I've watched that. That's a Thank great you. show. <laughs> and, and when Kevin Hart comes out, I hope you make fun of his height. Yeah, I'm, I'm taller than him. Yeah. Right, oh, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I'm gonna tell oh, him yeah. to relax. Matter of fact, I'm gonna have the ice tubs for him, like he do on YouTube. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Awesome. Well, Ahmad, it's it's been a little over an hour and a half. I appreciate you uh doing this. I really appreciate Absolutely. you taking the time. I love uh learning more about you that I did not know before tonight. And uh I, I hope we stay in touch, but it, it was a ton of fun, man. Definitely, man. Definitely got my number, man. Anytime you need me, let me know. I appreciate you guys for having me on your platform. It's been a pleasure. Keep up the great work, man, and thank be you. Great, man. Just be great. Continue to be great. Continue to be that positive vessel for, for individuals to share their stories. Because I appreciate you guys letting me share my story. All right, thanks, Amal. You're the man. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd also really appreciate if you'd rate and review us. You can find us at scodopodcast.com.